I've been asked to talk about our Wolfson Prize uh, winning essay, um, which came as a surprise to me. Um, to, 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 have, to have been awarded this prize. And, and, and it obviously links the question about where our grandchildren live. And um, the first thing, I, you'd probably notice on the statement that we were all asked to write, my, my, my grandchild, this is a very pressing question, because my grandchild is due next weekend. Um, and so um, the, she's going to be called Josephine. Um, it's already been named. And, and, and very, until very recently, I knew exactly where she was going to live, which is going to be in our attic. Um, because... <laughs> It's very difficult um, for, for someone on my son's salary to find out anywhere to live in Manchester. Um, and the reason is this. Uh, we're building hugely less housing than we need. I mean, that, that, this is the, the, the house building rate um, for the last, whatever it is, 50 years. Um, and we're building um, something in the region of uh, 100,000 homes a year. At the peak of the, the boom, we managed to get to 200. We need about 250,000 homes a year um, to meet a population growth, immigration, and so on. Um, and, and since we stopped building council housing, which is the dark grey bit there, we simply haven't been doing it. And, and we need to find a way of doing it. And this is something that politicians of all persuasions are, ve are very concerned about. Now, we did a piece of work um, for Friends of the Earth um, a long time ago now. Um, 95 it was published. Um, at the time when there were 4.4 million households projected and everyone said, where are we going to build them? And so those squares at the top there are at the same scale as the map and they say how much land is required in the UK to accommodate that um, level of housing growth in the cities. And I agree entirely with Corrine that most of it has to go into the cities. Um, and actually for Friends of the Earth we argued that 75% of all housing growth should go into cities, or could go into cities. Um, and Richard Rogers has said he's disappointed in me for moving away from that position in, in, in recent, in recent um, weeks. Um, I think there is an issue that, if we go back to that previous slide, the red line is house prices. And what's happened since we had that policy in, in, in the late 90s is that we haven't, to be honest, been building. Um, uh, what, what happened, we, we, the amount of housing in cities did go up to 75% at one point, but it was only because we were building so few houses. Um, what happened is we, we replaced suburban um, houses on greenfields with urban apartments. And as soon as we stopped building urban apartments, the amount of housing plummeted and house prices rocketed. Um, house prices in this country are obscene. Um, the, the house prices in Germany over the same period has been flat, believe it or not. House prices in real terms have not gone up in Germany over the same period as this graph. And so we need to find a way of dealing with that. And we say in the Wolfson essay that 60% of all new housing should go into cities. Uh, we don't move away from that position. However, as urbanists, what we've been doing is we've been ignoring the other 40%. And in doing so, we've been leaving it to the house builders. And they've been building crap. <coughs> and they've been building expensive crap. Um, this is our greenfield development, of course. Um, this is Edinburgh Newtown, which was built on greenfields. Um, and as was Bloomsbury, as was Bath. Um, just because we're building on green fields, it's not a shorthand for building suburban low-density developments. We can build um, urban development, which is functionally part of a city, on green fields. Of course, the issue being that that is the green belt. And you're not allowed to say that. I've been talking to lots of politicians over the last few months, and they hate it when you say green belt. Um, they, they, they just don't want to engage in that discussion. So in the Wolfson essay, we said uh, we shouldn't be building green uh, garden cities. Uh, we should be building extensions to existing cities. And we should be doing so on sufficient scale that you can service them with a tram and that you can provide pro proper infrastructure for them. And you shouldn't be building freestanding garden cities. We will never have any of that stuff. So the first thing is it's impossible to get, build a garden city from scratch, not if you're serious about the word city, which we are. Um, the second thing is to say um, that actually, it's a, it's an, of course, it was an economics prize, and we're designers. Um, and the first, second thing is to say that the quality of what we build is an economic issue. Um, so in Vathorst, I, I can't remember whether that's Vathorst or Freiburg, um, basically in Germany and Holland what happens is that when land is allocated for housing, the, the value is frozen. And so the, the housing, the land that that's built on is built at, with compensation for the owner but basically agricultural value. And so the difference in that between that and the price of British housing is, 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 is huge. It's about 200%. 200, I'll come back to that in a second. What we need to do is actually find a way of investing that money, not, in the, not giving it to the farmer and all the agents and so on that work for the farmer, but invest it in the housing and what we build. That's the key to finding a sustainable thing. That's why the quality of what we build is essentially an economics issue. So to explore this, um, we wanted to um, 
look at um, cities accepted. We're, we're going to grow cities, as we said. We want to look, look at places that could be expanded. Now, this, was a, this is a, a rod for our own back, because what happened was the press release um, announced all these places, and so I've been dealing with local radio stations <laughs> and newspapers from every one of them over the last few weeks, saying, how dare you say Taunton should double in size? Um, and this is impossible. Have you I've never been to Taunton? So, yeah. Um, what we said was that we should grow um, existing small cities, um, and to do to, to to develop the idea, we invented one, and we called it Uster. Uh, my fellow author Nick Falk calls it Uster because he's much posher than me. Um, but for the from the working class side of town, it's called Uster, um, and this is Uster. Um, the, the 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 city planning officer of the town it was based upon failed to recognise where it was. Does anyone know where that is? It's York. It's York. It's York, which has been reversed and span around and, and messed with, so it's not instantly recognisable. But York is about 200,000 a population, uh, about 80,000 homes. And what we said was that we can double the size of York. Uh, we'll let what, we, what we said, what would happen if we double the size of York? Uh, and so we developed this idea of a, what we call a snowflake plan. Um, and it's, um, we, they're not actually extensions, they're satellites. Um, and each one is about 50,000 people. Um, each one... Um, each, one's, uh, each one is about 25,000 homes, 50 to 60,000 people. Um, and it, the, 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 what we said was we need to do this in such a way that each of those neighbourhoods is walkable. So each of those circles is a 10 minute walk maximum. The middle of each circle is a tram stop. The tram is funded out of the value of the housing and that we can extend it. So we're, we're extending an existing place rather than building a garden city. And we said the whole of that is the garden city. And of course, Ebenezer Howard, that's the social diagram down below, did exactly the same thing. He didn't talk about freestanding new town. So there's our uh, development of Uster Garden City. Um, and it doesn't take very much land. Actually, the, the red circle is 10 kilometres from the centre of, of town. And it takes only 14% of the land area within that 10 kilometres to build that. All of which, of course, is Greenbelt. Um, and so the question is, how do we do this? And so the questions for the thing were, how do you make this pos popular? Now, we had a lot, spent a lot of time talking to people in villages around Oxford, which is an interesting experience. Um, and what it came out with was essentially a deal. They said, at the moment, housing dribbles out via the appeal process often on the least attractive piece of land around every village and town in the country. We, we build stuff which is unsustainable, isn't connected to anything around it, can't be served by public transport, has no infrastructure, and is, is essentially destined to be an unsustainable suburb. Take all that away and put it into these big urban extensions. And actually the CPRE in Oxford said, well, actually, if you can actually say that all our villages are going to be saved from that development, you've got our support. Um, so you extend an existing place. You take what I said, a confident bite out of the green belt rather than nibbling forever around its edges. Um, and so that's the first thing. And then having done that, we say that for every acre of building you develop, you create another acre of public open space. And you put that public open space in between <coughs> the satellite and the sensor. Um, we were pressed by a lot, quite a lot by Wolfson to say we should have a local referendum. Our view is this is actually, you, you, you'd lose it if you did that. Actually, what you should be very careful about having that. But we did, contrary to what Brandon Lewis suggested, suggest this is something that was voted on. This is, this is um, projected from the local area. So it's a co partnership of local authorities coming together to bid for this status as opposed to it being imposed from above. And so it's a bottom-up bidding process that we suggested. Um, I never put figures up on these things, but the, the key thing about this is we're, we're acquiring 6,000 hectares of land, we're paying 1.6 billion for that land, and when it's, when it's finished it's worth almost 6 billion. And the difference between that two, 4 billion pound, is what Ebenezer Howard called the unearned increment. That's the money that would normally go to the farmer and the agents and the planning consultants and the barristers who work for him, and we're saying that 4 billion pound for these homes gets spent on the tram, the stuff, I think the next one, yeah, don't look, there's, there's a lot of stuff there. It gets spent on all that stuff. Um, that's just one of the, that's why this is just one of the satellites. But it builds a tram, it builds the schools, it creates the open space. We use that money to actually create a viable place. Cash flow, this is from another, I won't go through this because it's from another presentation, but you can, cash flow, it. we had to make it work without any public subsidy. However, then finally, in terms of how we built it, and the key thing here is that the model we've got at the moment is based upon 10 volume builders who have been building all that crap for all these years. Um, and they do so having paid so much for the land. They, pay, they spend a 
tiny amount on the actual houses that they build on the site and, and even less on the infrastructure. So we're saying house builders can play in this. We're not going to exclude them from it, but we actually need to have at least as many houses built in other ways as we do by house builders. And so um, the whole process by which we put this forward is plot-based urbanism. Um, this is um, uh, at Almere in, in Holland, which is the custom bill scheme, which you may have heard about. Um, so we create a, um, a, 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 a framework for the garden city. Uh, we service it, we create a series of plots, we write rules for those plots, and we sell those plots. And so a house builder might buy 100 plots, an individual might buy a single plot and do a self-build on it. Someone like Lilac might buy a plot and put, put, put a group of 50 homes on it. So you actually create this plot-based urbanism to allow people to, um, to, to, to actually have a variety of ways of building houses. Uh, we suggested that you need an Act of Parliament um, to do this, to actually create a Garden City Act, to give CPO powers to the councils. Uh, we understand the Lions Review for the Labour Party has gone down a similar route, although we're waiting to see what happens when that gets um, announced eventually. Um, and here's the, one of our neighbourhoods. You can see the country parks. Uh, we talk about a Garden City Foundation that manages this whole process. Um, and we create a framework of streets uh, with a series of um, uh, plots that are created, a series of housing densities with plots, which then turn into something which looks like that. Actually, the plan is not the relevant thing. The process by which the plan is built is the relevant thing. Um, and we talk about these seven ages. We talk about it also being collectively managed. Um, and so when, when the, the stuff is finished, we, we, we have a collective neighbourhood management by which ground rents from each of the plots is used to manage the, 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 the neighbourhood, to look after the environment, to run the sustainability um, features of, of the neighbourhood. And then finally, um, when the thing is finished, we have essentially created one of the, another great estate, although one that's community owned. Um, so the great estates like Grosvenor and so on, um, who, who built the estates around London, still exist, they still develop. They are, they are asset-rich organisations which become um, developers that can take, take on major schemes. We've created one here, which is then owned by the community that lives in it, and so has the opportunity to look in other places and to develop further. Hopefully what we've also done is reform the way that we do development in this country so that we can actually capture that unearned increment and spend it on the quality of what we build. So thank you very much.